t-shirts for sale. All of the income from the t-shirts, as well as bags from previous years, as well as bags for crap go directly to charity. We take no income off of that. It goes directly to, to charities, to EFF, to Hackers for Charity, as well as uh, uh, others. So please go buy some bags of crap. So bags of craps are at least a t-shirt, as well as some additional stuff on top of that. Uh, of past conference t-shirts. Um, on top of that, we have a number of other activities going on. Uh, the wireless village, the lockpicking village, uh, a number of CTFs that are going on um, down on the other end of the conference. A uh, quick announcement. We love this hotel. This hotel gives us a lot of support. Um, the cost for sh running ShmooCon is held relatively low because of the support we get from this hotel. Don't screw with a hotel. If you screw with a hotel, we are going to kick you out. Okay, we love this hotel. They treat us really well. And for the most part, for a hacker conference, we have very low damage, very low negative impact. However, uh, we want to make sure that we remind you all, do not screw with the hotel. All right. Um, so with that, I have a few things to give away. So some trivia questions. Who was the last man to walk on the moon? Does anybody know? Say again. So far. No. John Glenn was not the last man to walk on the moon. Well, you all fail at Google. Who? No. Can none of you Google? Yeah, come have a, a, a Schmookon playing cards. All right. So relevant to this talk, what was the company previously na uh, previously known as Diebold rename themselves to? Not you. Ooh, 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 ooh. I know, I know. Somebody raise your hands. Sure, come have a uh, tactical notebook from ThinkGeek. You can clip it onto your belt or something like that. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, uh, we will be having a party tonight. We don't have details for that at the moment. Uh, you'll get those later on in the day. Um, T-shirts and stuff are, in the, uh, are for sale. I'm sure you're done, tired of hearing me talk, and you'd much rather see uh, from my left or from my right to the left, we Matt, Harry, and Maggie. Uh, talk about electronic voting. So please give a warm Schmookon welcome. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, Joe Hall is also, uh, this is uh, joint work with Joe Hall. Unfortunately, he is flat on his back um, and has agreed to not come and infect everybody with whatever he's got. So please thank Joe Hall for not being here. Um, the, um, so uh, this is essentially an update on the state of uh, electronic voting uh, in the United States, um, uh, kind of working from first principles. Uh, I apologize in advance. This is a very US-centric um, elections-oriented uh, uh, talk, although we'll be talking about why things that work in other countries may not work so well um, here. So let me start with first principles. Uh, the first principle for voting is this concept called one person, one vote. Um, um, and this is actually, you know, people think this is in the Constitution somewhere. It actually, those words aren't actually in there. Um, it, it's, it's, it's really more of a slogan, and we kind of use it as a test to decide, uh, do we have a fair election system? And if we have one person, one vote, um, then maybe we do. And if we don't, uh, then we definitely have something wrong. But you'll notice that one person, one vote depends on a lot of interpretations. Um, like, you know, what, is it, what are we voting for? What does this actually mean? And in fact, you know, if you look at the, uh, the republic in the United States, we mostly uh, vote for officials rather than particular issues um, who represent us. Um, but, uh, you know, we have this idea that the influence of your vote is supposed to be based on your citizenship, your personhood. Um, and if you are qualified as a voter, you get the same number of votes as everyone else. And in particular, you can't stop anyone else's vote from counting. Uh, your influence is entirely your vote. 
But of course, this, these concepts have evolved in the United States over time. Um, the slogan, you know, used to be one man, one vote, and then we kind of realized that that excluded a large number of other people um, in the United States, and it wasn't until surprisingly far into the 20th century that um, voting rights were extended to women. Um, we um, uh, obviously have had um, you know, uh, issues where substantially many people in the United States didn't even enjoy the privileges of citizenship and were in fact enslaved and not entitled to participate in our democracy. Um, and uh, the legacy of that has lived on. So this concept of one person, one vote is this very fuzzy and, and, and fluid concept that we've come to get a better understanding of over time, but there's still sort of disagreement about precisely what the requirements for that are. Um, if we look at the requirements for fair elections, um, it, it, it's actually a pretty complex problem. And um, you know, we have things like equal access to the ballot, um, equal access to the voter rolls, equal access to cast your, uh, uh, to cast your ballot. Um, this idea that almost all uh, citizens should be eligible to vote. Um, and one question is whether voting is optional or mandatory. In some countries that are democracies, voting is mandatory. In the United States, it's optional and in general less than half of us actually bother to do it. Um, we have some of these requirements start to look technical, um, like the idea that you should be prevented from casting more than one vote, that your vote should actually be fairly counted, um, that um, you uh, can't find out how someone else votes, and, um, and so on and so on. And when we start to look at this as a set of technical requirements, it starts to look like implementing one person, one vote is a pretty heavily constrained um, set of problems. Um, and in fact, some of these requirements actually, when we look at them from a technical point of view, kind of directly contradict one another. And the biggest one from a technological um, perspective is the requirement that we have ballot secrecy. No one can find out how you voted. Um, versus the requirement that we all trust the outcome and we have confidence that our vote was counted. So what that means is that we want it to be impossible to find out how someone else voted, even with their cooperation. That is, we don't want to allow people to be able to sell their vote or be coerced into revealing how they vote so they can't be intimidated into voting uh, a particular way. Um, and yet, at the same time, we want to be sure that all the votes actually got counted. Um, from a technical perspective, that's kind of hard. Um, and voting mechanisms have evolved to support these kind of contradictory requirements uh, that we have to pay close attention to the implementations of in order to make sure that those requirements actually got, get met. I've tried to rewrite um, one person, one vote as a more precise, in more precise terms, and it starts to look ugly. I, the best I could come up with is one adult citizen, one easily exercised but non-transferable option to cast a secret accurately counted vote after a fairly conducted public campaign that will determine their representative. Um, so I think that's what one person, one vote actually means in practice in the United States when we do it right. So where does technology come into this? So early elections in the US um, consisted of not really all that much more of getting people uh, together in a room, a town hall type meeting, and showing their hands to vote um, on uh, who their representatives are. Uh, that has two properties that you will notice. One is that it is not a secret ballot, and the other is that it doesn't really scale very well. Um, and so fairly quickly, voting mechanisms and technologies for voting have started, uh, started to get used uh, in the United States and around the world to help elections scale and to introduce other properties such as ballot secrecy. And the most obvious of those is, you know, you have a ballot box and you put a piece of paper in the ballot box. Um, but there are other um, uh, technologies that have evolved. Machine counted ballots, 
um, direct recording uh, voting machines, you know, those lever machines that uh, um, have the little uh, uh, switches and then you pull a big letter, lever and you hear this kerchunk sound when your vote gets cast. And then finally, um, in the uh, 21st century, we have started to see an increase in the use of computer technology for this. Um, the important thing here is that confidence in the election depends not just on what the rules for the election are, but on our public confidence that these mechanisms carry out these um, requirements. So technology has kind of quietly and evolved over time to be centrally important in our trust in the legitimacy of our government. Um, and uh, you know you, you can really uh, you know, look you need look no further at the technology of elections and our trust in them to see how important technology has become here now in the United States um, elections are pretty high stakes uh, you might have noticed that presidential elections, for example, get a lot of attention. There are ads on TV and stuff. Lots of money is spent. People really want to uh, elect their particular candidate. We have a long history of fraud uh, in elections in the United States, ballot stuffing, uh, trying to cast more than one vote, um, uh, tampering with the vote counting mechanisms, um, and so on. So one question we have to ask about any voting technology is whether um, this new technology that we want to use is going to help enable fraud or help prevent fraud. Uh, and in general, the answer is yes to both for every new technology that's ever been introduced. Um, the, um, there is an arms race between those who want to uh, tamper with uh, the results of elections and those uh, who want to introduce uh, uh, new technologies. So, a quick comment about voting in the United States. Um, one um, uh, uh, property of elections in the United States is they are highly decentralized. Uh, the federal government sets only very broad standards for elections. Each state has its own um, laws and rules and, and so on. But elections are in general run by individual counties. There are about 3,000 counties in the United States, and they do almost all of the heavy lifting for conducting actual elections. So what that means is that there are about 3,000 different um, offices that have to buy voting equipment and manage all of the aspects of virtually all aspects of uh, conducting an election. Um, in most of the United States, the actual voting process is further subdivided into individual precincts, polling places where you go and you actually cast your ballot. Um, U.S. elections are probably the most complex in the world. Um, and um, you know, one of the things that uh, people often say is, well, we do this in my country, why can't you do that uh, back in the United States? And one reason is that in the United States, we have um, more issues, more um, uh, uh, different ballots, and uh, a just a l much larger logistical problem than we have really anywhere else. Um, so, uh, how many people recognize this picture? Um, so this is from the recount of the uh, 2000 U.S. presidential election. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about the technology that was in use in that election because that really informs how we got to where we are uh, today. Um, this is a punch card voting machine. Um, the interesting property of this voting machine is the only electricity in the voting booth is used for the lamp to disp uh, to, that um, uh, shines on the ballot so that the voter can see it. Um, there is, uh, this is an entirely mechanical system from the voter's perspective. Um, what the voter does is basically pushes a little um, stylus through a hole corresponding to their um, uh, corresponding to their candidate in each race, um, that stylus punches out a little hole in their paper ballot card. Uh, there's a little little scored um, rectangles um, that are, sit under the holes in the voting machine. The interesting thing about this technology that we discovered in uh, the year 2000 is that in spite of the fact that it uh, is a completely mechanical system, it had a buffer overflow in it. Um, that is to say, um, uh, you punch out these little holes 
Um, but those holes, those little pieces of chad where the holes were go somewhere at the uh, afterward. And where they go is right underneath where uh, you punch them out. So what happens in a really hotly contested election where more people than usual show up is that toward the end of the day, the more popular candidates uh, have these little pieces of paper behind their hole that make it increasingly harder to vote for them because um, you have to really push the stylus down um, farther than you otherwise uh, would. And so by the end of the day, it can become if, you know, these are designed for a few hundred people in the day, if 500 people show up, uh, it can really get hard to vote for the popular candidates by the end of the day. And what can often happen, you can see right in the middle of this picture, is sometimes you'll only kind of dimple the piece of paper instead of knocking the hole out. And that plays havoc with the counting mechanism. And so uh, you may remember that there was all this recounting where people were taking a look at these dimpled and hanging chads. And there was an amazing thing that happened after the 2000 election. Half of the country was unhappy with the outcome. Half of the country was really happy with the outcome. But everybody agreed that the process was horribly flawed. And so Congress passed a hugely bipartisan uh, piece of legislation called the Help America Vote Act. Um, and uh, it ended up uh, uh, passing in 2002. Um, and it basically mandated that states shift to accessible voting technology. Um, which is to say um, things that could be used by the disabled um, without uh, uh, too much assistance and uh, definitely are not these little punch, screen ballot, uh, punch card ballots. Um, and it's, it provided substantial funding for states to buy this equipment. Here was the problem, though. Mostly that equipment did not exist at the time that the Help America Vote Act passed. So um, the, uh, what do you think happened? Well, we are, here we are in this um, um, uh, triumph of capitalism. The market quickly produced voting machines that states could buy with this giant pile of money um, that was created by Congress to comply with the Help America Vote Act uh, requirements. Uh, and these machines were uh, b basically very quickly um, sent out to market. Now. Um, there were three different technologies that Help America Vote Act uh, would uh, allow. The most prominent of them are called direct recording electronic voting machines, or DRE voting machines. DRE machines basically are touchscreen computers. Um, they um, voter um, points to where they want to vote. It records the voter's selection in internal memory in the computer, and at the end of the day, uh, the voters, all of the uh, vote tallies are read out of the machine electronically. So instead of a paper ballot, the record of the vote is entirely electronic and contained in the DRE voting machine. Now, why is this accessible? Well, the reason is because it's a computer interface, you can have um, you know, things like um, uh, audio interfaces, and even for the severely mobility impaired, things like SIP and PUF interfaces and so on. So you know, there's all sorts of adaptive technology that can be used with this. And for uh, voters who don't have disabilities, it's very much like using an ATM um, machine type of an interface. And this was a wildly popular choice uh, for states and counties to buy after the Help America Vote Act passed and provided funding to this. Um, as a the interesting thing is that the first people to maybe raise questions about these machines were computer scientists. Um, and, um, you know, the observation that we made very quickly is, by the way, you notice we suddenly have computerized voting. These voting machines are basically computers. These computers are configured by software. Um, and um, software is... Um, notoriously hard to get right. Um, maybe we don't want our elections to depend on the quality of software, and maybe we should take a look at whether the software running these voting machines um, works well. But that didn't bother everybody, anybody. Um, so uh, basically everybody bought DRE machines and deployed them throughout the United States. 
Um, so where is there software in election systems? Well, it actually occurs not just in the voting machines themselves, but in virtually every step of an election. Before the election, uh, we have um, uh, county computers, which are generally networked machines that um, do things like ballot definition, what's on the ballot, uh, provisioning the voting machines, configuring all of the different uh, electronic voting machines that are going to be used at precincts, uh, and registering voters, maintaining the uh, authoritative list. On election day, the voting machines themselves are deployed at polling places, um, and these are generally non-networked um, touchscreen computers that store the resulting uh, ballot choices in their internal memory. Um, and then finally, after the election, the memory cards from these machines are generally uh, brought back to county headquarters and um, uh, tallied, often by the same com networked computers that um, provisioned them in the first place, and they then report the uh, results and will be used as well if there are recounts, although what a recount means in this context is unclear. Uh, potential vulnerabilities with computerized voting. Well, all of the vulnerabilities with software-based systems, um, which is to say almost anything that could go wrong with these machines has catastrophic mechanisms to make it uh, go wrong. Um, so. Um, what does this um, actually look like? Well, in practice, there are four major vendors of um, voting systems. Uh, there's uh, ES and S, uh, election systems and software, um, which bought uh, Diebold um, called Premier Election Systems. There are also two other vendors, Heart Inner Civic and Sequoia. Um, ES and S and Premier, which are actually owned by the same company now, are, uh, is the majority vendor uh, for these systems. Um, all of these vendors produce DRE machines as well as paper optical scan um, systems. Um, and in every case, serious questions have been raised about the sort of quality and integrity of the software. So in 2007, the secretaries of state in Ohio and California both commissioned independent studies uh, from academics to look at the integrity of um, these different voting systems. And both uh, all of the people on the stage right now actually participated 10 years ago uh, in these uh, exhaustive studies of uh, the voting machine source code. What do you think we discovered? Well, what we discovered was, oh my god, it was even worse than we thought it could be. Um, every single aspect of these systems, um, from the um, touchscreen voting machines to the um, back-end software that runs them, in every case from every vendor, had exploitable vulnerabilities that could often be exploited by somebody with no more access than a voter or a precinct poll worker. And that was true of every vendor of every system of every piece of hardware. Uh, to give one example, uh, I led the team that looked at the ESNS system. What we discovered was that the, um, uh, every single input routine in every module of every component of the system uh, had buffer overflows in it that could allow you to um, uh, exploit it. And as a consequence of that, um, exploiting a single voting machine would allow you to virally propagate um, uh, your own software to every other aspect of the system by the next election. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of thing was pretty much true in every system that we, that we looked at. Um, to give you a kind of a quick example of some of the attacks were fairly sophisticated, some of them were also very simple. Um, so, and uh, one example is the... Um, uh, screen recalibration on the machine. We found that it was possible by pushing a few buttons uh, to recalibrate the uh, touch screen to make it impossible to vote for certain candidates so that because the uh, part of the uh, area of the screen corresponding to that candidate's vote would uh, not uh, register for that voter. Uh, we found you could disable logging by unplugging a uh, 
um, a, a, uh, 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 an RJ uh, plug, and we also uh, found that you could add new logs by plugging in your own terminal to it. Uh, we discovered that a POMTOP computer, um, a, a, you know, a, like a POM pilot, uh, along with a magnet, was sufficient to put the machine into supervisor mode, uh, which would allow you to do things like change its password or load new firmware through the infrared port that was on the front of the machine. So in other words, these machines, uh, you know, I think one of the things we didn't, we weren't able to put in our report um, was that uh, the only good thing we could say about these machines was that uh, they don't seem to have too many toxic materials in them for, uh, to ha harm the environment when they end up in landfills. But it turns out they also had lead acid batteries in them. So, um, the, uh, um, so these machines were just, you know, had horrible problems with them. We discovered this 10 years ago. Um, so um, one question is, where are we today? And I, with that, I'd like Harry to. All right. So, as Matt said before, there has been only very low number of studies, and actually, it has been very small group of privileged people who has been able to inspect the software. So, last summer, uh, what happened was I read from Twitter that DEFCON is going to have a hacking village, a voting machine hacking village, and I was in a bar as I usually am and was thinking myself, I wonder who is the idiot who is going to run that. It turns out that, that was Matt and me. Uh, so <laughs> I got the message 20 minutes later. So what we did was we ran a village uh, to help more people to have a first-hand experience. Uh, everybody should know what DEFCON is. The people who don't know, it's in Las Vegas. It's 25 years. Uh, it's 25,000 people growing steadily. We had two it's basically rooms. Basically, like Shmukan, but worse. Yes. Longer lines, you have to wait for two hours to get the room. Um, we had two rooms. Well, actually, eventually, we have three rooms. We have the speaker track. We had a village. When we started, this is what uh, the room looked like. Uh, when the doors were opened, this was what it looked 10 minutes later. There's actually working desks in between. Um, since we didn't have an election software to run into an election, the village turned immediately to be more hardware, firmware hacking village than a trying to uh, change the uh, outcome of the election type of village. So we, were, we had already well established that every machine in the village was hackable. That was not about it. It was about people who have never seen a voting machine or e poll book in their life and how quickly they can figure out how to hack that machine. And actually, that was shocking to us. Uh, it happened very fast. I have a next slide about that. Why this was possible is DMCA exempt. Joe was about to cover it. Now it's going to be Matt who is going to cover it later. But this wouldn't have been possible a few years ago because of DMCA. So everything happened really fast when we opened door. We opened the doors 10 a.m. We were supposed to have an introductory talk for people to understand what they are dealing with at 11. Well, before we even had that the first machine had fall, fallen wirelessly. There was a Danish scholar who, across the room, used the Wi-Fi. The, uh, the voting machine in question had a Windows XP first version unpatched. Wonderful. So Metasploit works wonderfully. And that was done. After the speech was done, already he had come back. He had a proof of concept. And team from Northern California had taken the e poll book down. So a lot of things happened. One thing would really make me feel good was, and hopefully Matt too, was how many election officials came there and wanted to hack the machine they are using in their daily business of running elections. They have never been able to study legally the machine they have to use. So there were a lot of people who came, yes, I, my county uses this machine, can I poke a little bit holes on that? So it was wonderful. Uh, we were organizing, Matt and I were the main organizer, Jake Brown, uh, Margaret McAlpine here, Jeff Moss was putting this whole thing together. I say it, everything happens so fast. Most of the villages are planning this for a year ahead. We had five weeks. And we were actually the biggest problem was to get the election machines logistically there. So we found them from eBay. A uh, couple of sellers got the message from the vendors saying, oh, you cannot sell them. But we got, anyway, uh, a sufficient amount of machines. We had uh, four different voting machines and one e poll book. Uh, the time available for people were uh, only the, uh, the hours mentioned. Uh, but we 
actually lend a couple of machines to the hardware hacking glitch. We lent the machines to the hotel rooms. Uh, literally 11 o'clock in the evening, uh, tweets came out like, well, I found this. Can you, somebody who understands elections, explain what this comment in a, hard, in a firmware happens? Well, also, the vendors, when they heard about the village, they went hostile. Uh, and they sent a letters to uh, the uh, jurisdictions using their machine, claiming that we don't have, by buying these machines, we don't have rights to those. But even more, making a claim that these are few rogue machines being sold in the eBay, uh, nothing to worry about. They're probably stolen machines. We will take legal action. So this is after DEF CON on the November 13th. They are still today voting machines sold in a hefty price of about $100. Uh, I think we bought one machine for $250. Uh, we actually bought a just a few weeks ago a voting machine which had never been publicly studied in any of the independent studies. That was in the eBay. I snatched that off. So that's going to be next year. Also, this might be a broke uh, machine stolen. So we went with uh, Margaret to the place where they sell those. Uh, the story behind it is that the uh, roof of a, a warehouse, an electric warehouse, collapsed. Uh, the uh, insurance company totaled everything, and they were an e-cycling co e uh, IT recycling company being sold. One thing what scared the living shit out of me was when I spoke with the guy. I said, "Yes, the jurisdiction came back and they bought and put it back in use." And we found out the number of jurisdictions are buying the machines from e-cycling companies and putting them back in use. No chain of custody, no knowledge what has happened to the machine. They just put them back in use. Now, it gets crazier. Would you buy a national security critical infrastructure, as DHS is, uh, is defined, from a website like this? This company is actually running the elections in three states. And that's the, the, the uh, website, how they sell it. Obviously, they sell. I want to blow up the one of the, the icons. Would you really buy this from the website? The answer is yes. Also, <laughs> there's something interesting here. They also sell the seals and locks. So, one of the seals here says, well, it's this official seal of Michigan. Obviously, they won't sell it to someone who doesn't have a corp uh, government uh, credit card and wants it to ship out of the state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, we didn't have the software. Next year, we want to run an end-to-end -end election in summer. So this was really about a hacking the actual firmware and, and the environment. Uh, it's also interesting how stupid these things are. So we were doing everything in a e-poll book. Uh, you have to vote for him. He's a good guy. The whole structure of the database was reconstructed by the people from error messages. Uh, people were hacking and trying to guess the passwords. So they were already guessing passwords. And then one team, I think it was actually Maggie, found this website. And in the website, you find everything. Interestingly enough, the, the training document says these are the default passwords. Don't change them. And if they have been changed, change them back. This is a machine which is used to count about 18% of the US votes. So there you go. Very hard to guess the passwords. So anyway, uh, we had an incident. Uh, one of the ePoll books we got had uh, 654,000 uh, personal information in, turn it over to uh, the proper authorities. Uh, the machines were not sanitized when they are sold. Uh, all kind of craziness. And uh, we were giving only uh, the PCMCI cartridges, uh, memory cards, RDA devices, everything else uh, you had to bring on. This device saved the day. Uh, because actually the, soft, uh, the hardware is so old that the modern tools don't work. So wonderful general purpose uh, uh, GPIO was enough. And that allowed us to pull the, the firmware out in a lot of the machines. Uh, as Matt mentioned, IRDA, these actually are beaming the totals, aggregating the votes, and uh, beaming the, the, the uh, ballots over infrared. 
or Wi-Fi in, in the case of uh, the WinVote. And that's Matt doing that. And, you know, this just happened before DEFCON, so I don't, that speaks for itself. All right, so um, I guess you could ask now, like, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> uh, the fact that you have these machines that can be hacked and, you know, who knows if they have been. So one thing that's going on in states right now is uh, various auditing measures. Um, you might be surprised to know that really isn't any implemented right now. So one of the, uh, the two types that um, at least I'm familiar with are risk-limiting audits um, and transitive audits. Risk limiting audits uh, were conceived of, yeah, I'm sorry for the wall of text, I just, I guess, hate you all. So, uh, <laughs> risk limiting audits were conceived of by uh, Dr. Philip Stark from UC Berkeley, and it's basically a statistical uh, way of ballot polling where you don't have to recount the entire election to determine whether or not the winner is likely the winner. It doesn't actually um, say that the winner is um, definitely that person. It just means that, like, you know, if they have an 80% margin, you can probably pull, like, three ballots and you that person won on those three ballots, you can be reasonably certain they did win by that much. So um, that's being piloted right now in Colorado, California, and some other states have expressed interest because it's cheaper than doing like a full recount. The one I was most familiar with was transitive audits, which is basically where you use a commercial off-the-shelf off scanner, high-speed scanner, and uh, open source software known as uh, uh, OpenCount which Hari helped develop, and you basically run a parallel process because for various reasons, including legal ones, sometimes the vendors don't like you to audit their machines. Uh, so this allows you to basically run a parallel audit and then look at that machine by the results that you get from that one. And you can find all sorts of interesting things from this, which we have in the past. Um, for example, um, sometimes like uh, one voting machine will say that this is a vote. It's got a line going through the bubble. Well, actually, that line is somebody writing screw you across their ballot, uh, and the machine just sort of picked it up. So this is another type of, uh, of audit that's not currently um, quite as much being implemented, but it's really interesting, and we've found some really fascinating stuff with it, and you can read that later. Um, which kind of brings me to the point of like, well, the problem with those audits is that they both require ballots, one thing you can't do with a DRE touchscreen. You, um, at the moment, paper is one of the most effective things we know of that you can anonymously record somebody's um, vote and they can walk away and we can't trace it back to them necessarily, I guess, unless they sign it, which you're not legally allowed to do. So that's why there's big initiatives in the uh, voting security world to get paper ballots back into states that haven't had them since uh, basically the Help America Vote Act. And this kind of brings me to the question of internet voting, which ine inevitably comes up. So it's kind of like the DRE problem, but compounded with the fact that, you know, anyone in the world can vote wherever they are, no matter what country they are from. <laughs> so uh, in your election. So the internet is often, in, people will often ask, why don't we have internet voting? I can bank from my phone. Why can't I vote from my phone? For one thing, online banking gets hacked all the time. Uh, so maybe that's not the comparison you want. But I would also point out that they are solving completely different problems. Uh, when you have money stolen from your account, you know how much money you have. Your bank knows how much money you have. Other people in your life might not uh, know how much money you have, and you don't mind telling them how much was stolen. With your vote, you have plenty of legitimate reasons to not want somebody to know how you voted. You might not want the government to know how you voted. You might not want your spouse to know how you voted, or your community, or your friends, or your job. So that secret ballot protects you. And at the moment, there is no system, at least none that I know of, maybe they can correct me, that allows you to have an auditable, anonymous system, as anonymous as leaving a piece of paper somewhere that has recorded your vote. And no, blockchain won't help, because that also violates your privacy, uh, and only solves the chain of custody issue, which is one of the simplest ones to solve. Um, we also did a study on one of the other thing that people often point to is Estonia, which has one of the most sophisticated, I guess, internet voting systems out there. We went there with the University of Michigan and we looked at them and we discovered a high schooler could have programmed their system. It was extremely flawed and um, uh, they didn't like that, but <laughs> you can find the study on estoniaevoting.org if you want to know more. I didn't want to necessarily talk about that one. But that's another issue that comes up with all this. So one thing that should come out of the DEF CON voting village is further confirmation that we really should not be voting online. Um, also, there's uh, one thing that we didn't get to bring up enough in the e-voting, um, e uh, sorry, the um, 
DEF CON Hacking Village, which I wish we had been more verbal about at the time, was like how people can help who aren't hackers, who can't necessarily hack the machines there. One of them was to volunteer as a poll worker. This is something that every election official will tell you and ask you and beg you to do, because the technical knowledge level is very low. Most of the people are like, retirees who want to get out of the house or just help their community. And even if they're younger, they're not always people who can like ch tell if there's something wrong with the machines. So that's like a really valuable thing that everyone in this room who has a very high technological level compared to your average poll worker can do to help. Um, promoting aud auditing measures in your states, if it's out there. And um, yeah, and also check out nonprofits like Verified Voting. And I think I'll pass it. Okay. So just a couple couple sort of parting words. So um, in uh, November, um, I got asked to uh, testify um, on, on the Hill in the uh, House uh, Government Reform and Oversight uh, Committee um, on electronic voting. And they asked me basically, you know, spend five minutes, and then they told me, oh, actually four minutes, uh, you know, giving us your recommendations on what we should do to um, in um, going forward with voting and um, what the situation is. And it turns out that four minutes is actually kind of enough to summarize what the current state of the art of voting um, is. Uh, the first is a, a concept that was invented, uh, discovered by uh, Ron Rivest uh, at MIT, he's the R in RSA, uh, who's been interested in electronic voting um, really from the very beginning of this. And he came up with this very elegant concept called software independence as a desirable property for uh, voting systems. And the idea of a software independent voting system is that it is simply one in which you can use computers and software, but the integrity of the outcome shouldn't depend on the integrity of the software. That is, you can detect a, uh, a flaw um, in the count and then recover from it and find out what the true vote was. Um, and systems should be designed with software independence as a desirable property. Well, how can you do that? Um, and, well, it turns out there is existing technology that can do software independent um, voting. And one um, way to do that is with a HAVA legal um, system, um, optical scan um, voting uh, machines. Uh, this is an example from 2007 made by ESNS. Um, the, this is basically the use of a paper ballot that you mark um, and you put it in a device that uh, looks sort of like a fax machine or a shredder, depending on whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. Um, but it reads your ballots, uh, records the ballot markings uh, internally, maintains a tally electronically, just like a DRE machine does. But most importantly, captures your ballot into a regular ballot box after it's been read. And it has some additional advantages, like if you inadvertently vote for two people for president, it can reject your ballot and give you a chance to correct it before you walk away. Um, so uh, why is a system like this software independent? Well, it's software independent if you do a couple things. The first is uh, if you audit the machines enough so that you are statistically likely to catch a software failure in either the internal tally on the machines or in the back-end tallying system. How can you do that? Well, the technique of uh, risk-limiting audits is a way to achieve that. Um, so simply switching to existing off-the-shelf technologies, um, such as um, optical scan with risk-limiting or, or transitive audits, um, is enough to achieve software independence, and we can kind of do this today if we have the political and social will to do this. Um, so this is actually, a, a, you know, an optimistic um, uh, look to the future. Almost all voting talks by technologists are sky is falling, things are terribly um, um, wrong, there's nothing we can do about our uh, elections to fix them. In fact, there are, there are some simple things that we can do very easily and this technology could be deployed in the 2018 election if we, if we want to nationwide. Um, that's not in and of itself completely sufficient though because this looks only at the precinct side of the, the actual vote casting side of an election system. As I mentioned earlier, um, computer technology, potentially very vulnerable computer technology, is used at almost every stage of an election from provisioning the voting machines, defining the ballots, 
um, on to uh, tallying the results, reporting the results, and doing the recounts. Um, interestingly, in 2016, you've probably heard reports about Russian hacking. We still don't know what all of that was about. What we do know is that um, you know, various ent entities were uh, attacking county and state voting official systems um, and compromising them. And in spite of the fact that we know that individual voting machines um, were, uh, are horribly vulnerable to all sorts of technical attacks, that's not actually, as, it, as far as we can tell, what was being attacked. Instead, what was being attacked were back-end systems. Um, the systems that provision machines, the systems that count the votes, uh, and the systems that register voters and produce the list of registered voters um, on election day. How much that actually affected the 2016 election, you know, tune in later, we'll find out, maybe, um, uh, in, in the history books, uh, assuming they're still allowed to be written in the future. But, the, uh, but what we do know is that those were the systems that were targeted by very capable state actors. And those systems are critically important to election day operations, right? There could be all sorts of chaos if registered voters aren't allowed to vote at their polling place and so on. So we need to not only switch to better voting, vote casting technology with risk limiting audits and paper ballots and software independence, but also recognize that county and state level officials, those systems need to be regarded as heavily protected critical infrastructure and really safeguard them in ways that we, we haven't um, begun to do. The optimistic note, there appears to be political will to do this. There was a bill introduced in the Senate, an amazing piece of bipartisan legislation, amazing drafting on the bill. Both parties um, are, are enthusiastic about this, called the Secure Elections Act. If you want to see a beautiful piece of legislation that's taken, um, that has a lot of technology-related um, components to it, it, it it's, it's really worth your attention. Um, it's called the Secure Elections Act, although it is still a bill, if you want to know the difference between between a bill and an act, um, see Schoolhouse Rock. Um, the, um, but, so there's a long way to go before it becomes law, um, but this is an excellent starting point. And with that, we have approximately three minutes for questions. Please form your question in the form of a question and not a rant. So, so I saw your hand. I don't know if there's a microphone out there, but uh, just yell. Yeah, there are all sorts of issues with elections like gerrymandering and stuff like that beyond the scope of what we're talking about. Still important, but not, not what we're talking about here. Yep. Yes, sir. You. Yes, so that's an example of a, you know, an online system. You know, there are a lot of systems that are absolutely beautiful in um, the um, sort of um, elections research community that are not ready for prime time and have you know, uh, difficulties when you look at the full set of requirements in a democracy. Uh, let me also point out that a uh, number of Western democracies have in their constitution and the legislation a requirement that the common man with no special educational tools has to be able to understand how the votes are counted. So until we are in a Star Trek universe where teenagers are casually talking about quantum physics, we are not going to be able to use online homomorphic encryption systems. Right. Because I'm going, not going to explain that to 80 year old. Right. Okay. <laughs> you, you, sir. Yes. Yes, you. Question about uh, volunteering as a poll watcher. The 2005 group of New York State uh, voted that you volunteer on the network to watch the polls and bring with this network devices that you lost the traffic, you lost the network devices, and you win. Yep. So, so one thing, let me, let me not directly, I don't know of any specific initiatives, but let me just reemphasize, make friends with your local voting officials. They are doing God's work. I mean, and, you know, they are in um, uh, uh, all sorts of constraints in what they're doing. They get attacked all the time. Nobody is happy. You know, half the people are unhappy with the outcome of elections. Um, they are trying their best with horribly under-provisioned uh, resources. 
they, you know, volunteer to be a poll worker, learn who those people are, make friends, spend some time at the polling places as a poll worker, and, you know, your technical expertise will be much more welcomed once they understand that you understand what their problems are. So, so I think uh, we, we have time for zero more questions, but uh, thanks very much, and uh, we'll be around. <laughs>